Well, TV Watchers, one of the hottest shows this season was Pose on FX, which brings the ball culture of 1980s New York right to our TV screens. I'm Sam Ackman of Gold Derby, and I am lucky enough to be sitting here with the co-creator and executive producer, Stephen Canals. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having uh, me. This, as I mentioned, it's the show is steeped in the ballroom scene from New York, and I was curious as to what your first introduction with that culture was like. My first introduction to the ball culture, I think like a lot of folks, was Jenny Livingston's documentary, Paris is Burning. Um, and what I was so struck by the first time that I saw the documentary is that my parents were raised in Harlem. Um, and I lived in Harlem for a bit as a boy in the 80s. Um, and while I was young, I don't think I nor my family had any idea that this incredible community existed. Um, and as a queer Afro-Latin person, who grew up in, in the Bronx, like, you know, the fact that this community existed and was a subculture and that, that there were other people who um, lived just around the corner from where these balls were taking place, it just, it, it was so striking for me, particularly when we're talking about, you know, representation in film and television. And the fact of the matter is that growing up, I didn't really see very much representation of people who looked and sounded like I did. And so the fact that, that there were people on film, you know, in this documentary who grew up in the same neighborhood and held the same identities as I was, was very moving for me, especially as someone who is still coming into their queerness and, and you know, was in their early 20s. Yeah. It's so interesting because I, I think Paris is Burning You Right is most people's introduction to that. And yet it is such a vibrant culture that has really influenced so many other areas. Um, so I was curious, what sort of sparked, was there one aspect of it that really inspired you to create a series? You know, as a young, I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but I think as like a young gay boy, like I loved flash dance and I was always so moved by it. And and obviously as a kid, like I remember watching Fame. And so I'm not a dancer, but I think I've always had an appreciation for the arts and specifically um, when it comes to like bodily kinesthetic movement. Um, and so all that to say that that was the thing that I was, one of the things I was struck by in the documentary. And so outside of that, I've, you know, having grown up in housing projects in the midst of both the crack and AIDS epidemics, um, you know, Paris is burning and really the ballroom culture as a whole, but specifically the documentary, it just checked a lot of boxes that were personal interests of mine. You know, there's that cultural, socio-political um, layer to the narrative, but then there's also the vibrancy and the joy. And so I always felt like that would be such a beautiful marriage for, for narrative content. And was so surprised because, I mean, the first time I saw Paris is Burning was 2000 and I think it was 2002. And I just remember thinking, how has no one adapted this into a show? It just felt like it was ripe and primed to be told, you know? And at that time, I mean, you know, we hadn't quite sort of landed into um, shows like Lost. And I think we were right in the cusp of like this now platinum era of TV. You know, HBO had sort of just released um, like Sex and the City and The Sopranos and, you know, but, but, TV as we know it now was still sort of on the rise. And it just felt like, oh, this is a story that should be told and was shocked that, that it hadn't been. Although in reality, it's not that surprising, right? It's centering queer trans people and black and brown people. And the reality is that we're still not occupying a whole lot of space, you know, in terms of mainstream TV. Um, but anyway, to directly answer your question, I think, you know, there were a lot of elements from the documentary that to me were interesting. And I thought, I'd love to see all of those in one show. Well, and speaking of, you're talking about still to occupy that huge space in television. It took you a few years to get someone to say yes, I believe, when you finally found Ryan Murphy. Um, was there, did you find a lot of hesitancy in the industry to take on this story? Yeah, there was a lot of resistance to, to telling the story. You know, I spent two years in and out of, offices, you know, talking about this story and, 
you know, having this pilot be circulated and, you know, being told it was too niche, you know, which really is coded language for it's too queer and it's too trans. It was too urban, which really means it was too black and it was too brown. You know, it was a period piece. You know, it just felt risky. You know, I was I kept hearing it doesn't feel mainstream enough. And then there were all these sort of gotcha questions like who is the audience for a show like this? You know, which was one that I heard quite often, or who are we supposed to cast in these roles? And so, the, you know, there was a lot of resistance to to getting it made. And, and fortunately for me, I met, prior to meeting Ryan, I met one of our executive producers, Sherry Marsh, who was really the first person after two years to say, I think that this is a show. I think this is more than just a sample. Because the reality is that that original pilot, which I wrote as a grad student at UCLA studying screenwriting, had legs, you know, it was it was opening up all the doors, it just wasn't keeping me in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and she was the first person to say, wait, 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 don't leave. I think that there's potential here. And she was the person who connected me to Ryan. Wow. And you spoke of casting, you actually, there's five trans women in the main cast and it's, you've assembled the largest cast of trans actors on TV, which is pretty incredible. Was that casting process, uh, difficult for you? Was there pushback in that regard? Or was that always a thing you demanded? No, I, you know, the very, for one of the first questions I asked Ryan, the very first time that we met was, um, what's your, what are your ideas when it comes to casting? Because at this point, I heard so many people say, I don't know who we're going to cast for this. And my response was typically, I I don't know who we would cast because I haven't met these actors yet, but they're out there. Um, and you can imagine, you know, what the re response to that was. Mm -hmm. um, and Ryan really was the first person who was like, well, obviously we'd go out there and we find a group of unknowns. You know, we're gonna find great untapped talent. And he'd already done that with Glee, you know? And so I think he was familiar with that process. Um, we're fortunate in that we have collaborators in FX, who is a fearless network and they obviously were you know, very open to us going out there and casting authentically. And so the process was fun. It was long, you know, it was six months. Um, but we had a really great, or have a great casting director in Alexa Fogel, who worked on The Wire for HBO, which also casts a lot of unknowns. And she most recently cast, you know, Atlanta and Ozark. And she was wonderful. She went out into the ballroom community and she found these really incredible actors to inhabit these roles. Yeah, and it feels, I think the whole show feels authentic in that regard. To those actors, because I know like MJ Rodriguez does have experience from a very young age with the ball culture, mm -hmm. do they ever come to you or the other writers with their own ideas that they want to incorporate? Um, yeah, they definitely will share parts of their journey and parts of their story with us. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't always make its way into a script. Part of it is that you know, it's, it takes a lot to share in that way, right? And I think that some of their stories are really heartbreaking and we definitely don't want to re-traumatize anyone, you know? So I think there are elements of all of, of our actors' lives within the scripts. And I think it would be up to them to, to share, you know, with, with, with an audience, like what those elements are. Um, but for the most part, I think, you know, our, our story is rooted and grounded in, in truth. And so even if it isn't directly their story, I think for the most part poses a little bit of all of our narratives, you know, including our writer's room. I mean, there are so many elements of my life and Ryan's life and Brad Falchuk and, and Janet Mock and Our Lady J's lives throughout the first season and definitely in the second as well. Yeah, you have quite a writer's room going. I wonder what it's like to, having written that original pilot back when you were a student, what is it like experiencing now all these other talented people expanding on those ideas? Oh, it's incredible. You know, I, more than anything, you know, as a, when I was an idealistic grad student working on an MFA in screenwriting, I, I always said to my, my instructors, I just want to collaborate with people who are as passionate about the material as I am. And I 
you know, I'm just really, I don't want to say lucky because I, I don't think it's luck, but you know, I'm just really, I'm so grateful and humbled and I have so much gratitude. You know, we have a, a small writer's room, you know, it's just the five of us. And then obviously like our writing assistants and, but everyone brings their full selves to the table when we're working on pose and everyone is so willing to open up their hearts to this narrative. I think we all from the very beginning, when we came together as a group, we knew that the story was going to be groundbreaking and really life-changing. And it didn't matter to us if we had an audience of one or if we had an audience of a million. You know, we knew that this show was gonna go out into the world and that someone was gonna respond to it and that it was gonna matter to that person. Um, and so I'm just really, I, I'm sort of still in disbelief that that I'm in the place that I'm in and that I have such incredible collaborators. Well, I, one of the main threads of the story to me that I always come back to in this series is the concept of family mm -hmm. and sort of our biological family versus, you know, for queer people, the found family we create. Mm -hmm. uh, what was sort of the important, the importance of, of that? What did you want to explore within that in the series? Well, I think that when we're talking about the LGBTQ plus community, you know, we really have to rely on one another. You know, we are really one of the only communities where our, our story, our narrative, our rich history as a culture isn't taught in curriculums. You know, we as LGBT people, we have to go out into the world and we have to seek that knowledge for ourselves. Um, and I, you know, particularly as someone who's, you know, who grew up in the 80s and, and now as an adult, as someone who's nearing 40, um, you know, I'm hyper aware that there's a whole generation of queer and gay men that we lost because of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, and, and so it was important that the show was uh, a way to pay homage to those lives. Um, but also a way to remind queer people, especially today where we have an administration that says that your life and your voice doesn't matter and you have no value and we keep on rolling back protections and rights, you know, for trans people, you know, it's critically important to remind everyone like, no, 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 you are still part of this incredible community and you are deserving of love and you're deserving to, of, of joy and having your life, knowing that your life and your voice matters and regardless of whether it's your your own blood relatives or church or government or schools, that you can go out there and find your tribe. You know, you are fortunate. The moment that you come out and you decide to, whether you come out or not, you know, you are part of this incredible community and we all are here waiting for you to love you and to support you. Um, and so don't forget that. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it kind of speaks to you know, when you were talking about administrations and things that tell queer people that they don't matter, um, it speaks to there's a kind of duality in the series of their life that's in the real world that's uh, oppressive and they face poverty and violence and discrimination versus they kind of escape to the ball. Um, do you find that's what was important for you in, in that sense? Is that a way for you to explore what you're talking about? Definitely. I mean, I think that Here's the thing, we often treat historically marginalized communities in this very monolithic way. And I think historically, especially if we're talking about representations in film and television, you know, A, we just don't have a lot of representation, particularly when it comes to like mainstream um, cinema or mainstream television. Um, but we typically only are given one or two narratives, right? So we're the, we're the sassy sidekick you know, or we are, um, and especially in, in the case of trans people, you know, you are the, the catalyst for some really dramatic story. You know, you're the body that's found. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, I was just really tired of that, A, but I also really wanted to affirm LGBT people's lives and to show hopefully anyone coming in whether you're someone who is still coming into your queerness and dealing with internalized homophobia or transphobia, 
you know, whether you're someone who's straight or cisgendered and you really have never met a queer or a trans person, I wanted everyone to know our lives are filled with all the same hopes and dreams and fears, just like everybody else, that we also, um, that we have uh, joys in our life and we also have hardships. And I think that that's really what's at the core of Pose and the ballroom community and then what's happening outside of the balls, I think is a beautiful juxtaposition of both those pieces, right? Mm -hmm. It's that even in the midst of all of this crisis and all of this darkness, that you can still find levity and joy and happiness and hope. Yeah, I, I think it's really one of the best examples um, when I think back on this season for me is the Mother's Day episode where Blanca has, uh, you know, her mother passes away and she has a really traumatic con confrontation with her family and especially her brother. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the flip side, her ball family, her house comes to support her and rally around her. Um, I think that really spoke to people. Do you hear from the community at all? Or lots of feedback regarding the ways it speaks to them? Absolutely, um, particularly when it comes to, to trans women. You know, I think that they all, there are many trans women out in the world who have had similar experiences, you know, I, I think, and, and, you know, frankly, for, for, you know, gay and lesbian and bisexual folks as well, and gender non-binary individuals, you know, that there's always going to be that process. I think there's a very small percentage of people who, when they come out, their families are understanding, you know, I think it's getting better, but the reality is I think a lot of individuals are met with, you know, resistance and, you know, have to deal with families who just aren't, aren't aware, you know, and don't, and don't really know how to support them in the moment. Um, and so, yeah, I've definitely heard from a lot of, of fans of the show who, and our viewers who said that, you know, that story spoke to them, um, you know, that it was very reminiscent of the experience that they had. Um, and I think, fortunately, I'm, I'm now I'm reflecting on the people who have, who have talk to me about that particular arc. Um, fortunately for a lot of those folks, their moms are still alive. And so they were able to have closure in a way that, you know, it, it obviously was difficult for Blanca because her mother passed away. And so they didn't get to have that moment with one another. Yeah. Um, well, I'm wondering because, you know, season two is right around the corner. We're a few days away from the premiere. It's aptly, we're in the middle of Pride Month here in New York. We're gearing up for World Pride for the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. Um, was there anything heading into season two, like was there anything you learned or took away from this experience with season one that changed your process heading into this new season? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, Gosh, I don't, I don't know. That's... Or just any favorite takeaway from season one? Well, I think, you know, the, for me, the biggest takeaway from season one was to just to not navigate the process of writing from a place of fear. You know, I think that there was a lot of overthinking for me during the first season. This was like, I don't know, a show like this has never been out in the world before. We didn't know if we were going to find an audience. We didn't know if the audience was going to understand the story that we were telling. And so there were a lot of moments of, um, for me anyway, of going back to the page and sort of overthinking story and overthinking, you know, even just lines of dialogue. Um, so I was like, I don't know, like, will the audience, are they gonna be behind us? Is this the moment where we're going to lose them? Um, and so after having that, you know, our first season out in the world and seeing how warmly it was received, you know, going back in for season two, I knew that we could take some big risks, you know, that we could take chances narratively and that the audience was going to still be there, that they're gonna show up because they just are invested in the story, they're invested in these characters and and have fallen in love with them. Yeah, well, um, I, I had the honor of talking to MJ earlier, uh, about a month ago, and I asked her to sum up season two with three words. So I want to see if your three words would match, or how would you describe, without spoiling anything, mm. how your three words for season two go? Ooh, three words. Um, I think, well, bold, 
is definitely one. Let's say bold. Um, vibrant. Good one. Heartfelt. Oh. Okay. She said heart wrenching. So interesting that you have heartfelt there. We'll see how they how right. they go. She's heart, -wrenching, heart wrenching, solidifying, and raw. So we'll take yours oh, wow. into account too. Uh, well, we're all very excited for season two. Thanks so much for sitting down with me and best of luck with the continued run of the show. Thank you. It's great chatting with you.